With the troubles of this world and the troubles of this world.
never heard that story before. <laughs> and that would not be the first time that things like that happen. The sons of the prophets. The sons of the prophets, that's kind of the community of prophets. The head prophet is Elisha. He's recognized as being the head of the community, and everyone else is known as the sons of the prophets. The sons of the prophets said to Elisha, the place where we're living now is too small. So let's go to the Jordan River, and each of us take from there a beam so that we can make a larger place that we can live. And Elisha said, go. And they said, please come with us. And he said, okay. Well, they went there, and they began to cut down the trees. But as one of them was felling a beam, the axe head slipped off and flew into the water. He cried out. He said, alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then Elisha, the man of God, said, where did it fall? And when the man had indicated the place, Elisha cut off a stick, threw it in there, and made that iron axe head float. And he said, take it. And the man reached out and picked it up from the surface of the water. Doesn't it seem like a waste of a perfectly good miracle? I mean, an axe head for crying out loud. So this, the, the, uh, as the entourage of Elisha, the group of the prophets. So we think about there being a prophet, but there's always like a noteworthy prophet. But then there's a, a bunch with them too. And the prophets are, at this point in time, the prophets, see, over, over the history of Israel, the, the role changes. It shifts around a little bit. Later on, you start to have the rabbis as the teachers, as the religious functionaries. Earlier, you have the priests and the Levites. Um, so the priests and the Levites, during the time when the temple was actually a tent that traveled around, they were scattered around the country, and th there were these locations where the, the tabernacle would go with the Ark of the Covenant, but those were permanent fixed locations. 
they were semi-permanent from the perspective of the Ark, but they were permanent in that, that that was a place where people worshipped. So there was always a kind of a group of functionaries there, sort of running things, doing religious stuff there, and then they'd come in with the Ark, and then that, that was the big time. And then it would go somewhere else, and so it kind of moved around. Um, and then when that got fixed in Jerusalem during the time of, of first at David, the com- the uh, the tent ends up in Jerusalem and it stays there. And then it's then the temple re- takes the place of the of the tabernacle. Now suddenly you you start the the importance of these external places becomes a little bit lost, and um, and then especially now in the period we're in, which is the divided what's called the divided monarchy. So this is now a time where there's a split between north and south, and you start to have the rise of prophets. Where I mean, there's always the prophets around. They kind of start showing up, um, but then it. They, they become more, they start to have more jobs. So you end up with these, the, the sons of the prophets, this sort of group of prophets who do this religious work. And I'm assuming that when people come and they need like prayer or whatever, they come to first flunky prophet, you know, Z. And then if it's too tough for them, they're supposed to pass it up and eventually it reaches Elijah. If the really important stuff get, gets to Elisha. So uh, it's simple matter that, you know, Elisha's been pretty potent. He's done a couple of miracles. He's gotten a lot of attention, and so there's been more people kind of gathering around him, and they, they're out of space. And, and to their credit, they, they don't go, <laughs> Elisha, we're out of space. When you build more stuff, they go, hey, how about if we each go and we'll each cut down one tree, and then we'll use the lumber, and we'll build some additional housing? Because, in other words, they're taking personal responsibility as a group. We're all going to do this and we're all going to... They don't expect Elisha to cut anything down, but they do ask him to come along. And then we have the tragedy of the axe head. <laughs> Whoa! Right into the river. I'm assuming that they were digging around for it before Elisha came along. This story obviously is compressed because, you know, if it had just landed in the river, you kind of would have thought, well, just go and pull it out. It's just on the bottom somewhere. <laughs> You know, so they must have been looking for it and not able to locate it. Um, that's my assumption anyway. Either that or they were just too delicate to get wet. I, but I'm pretty sure that they, at this point, I think when Elisha kind of wanders by, uh, they're probably up to here in water going, we can't find, oh, master, we've lost the axe head, right? And uh, the, the problem is that it's borrowed. And that says something to me about the borrowing process. You know how you want to borrow a tool from your neighbor? And there's always the neighbor who never returns it. <laughs> Who's got my axe anyway? <laughs> and you go to talk to them, and they go, oh, I lent that to so-and-so. And so your axe maybe has made its way through a few neighbors by the time you get it back. Always put your name on everything. That's my rule. <laughs> if you're going to lend it, make sure your name is on it. Uh, uh, by the way, here's a great thing you can do with your phone is when somebody borrows something, take a picture of them holding it. <laughs> Delete the picture when they return it. And, you, and your excuse is, I just can't remember who's got, you know, who borrowed it, and then I get confused and like, who's got that? So click. <laughs> yeah, right? Phones are useful sometimes. Uh, so I imagine that the person went, you know, that this, this prophet, this one of the sons of the prophet, shows up at somebody's house and some neighbor and goes, hey, can I borrow your ax? <laughs> Now, we're told something about this axe. We learned it's made of iron. Um, that's interesting. That might, be, that might actually be noteworthy. It might explain some of the, like, about around this. Um, because uh, this is the period of time which is sort of that a- beginning of the Iron Age, the end of the Bronze Age, which means that most common tools are still made of bronze, and iron is predominantly used for weapons. That's what happens in those transition periods. So the, the newest technology gets used first for military application and only later makes its way down into sort of conventional use. So somebody having an iron axe at this period of time, that may actually have been fairly pricey. So it's like, can I borrow your axe? My baby, that's my axe. (laughs) What do you mean you want to borrow my axe? It's made of iron, you know? So that could be a little bit of what's behind this. And then you also know how this worked because the borrowing process included that promise. You know the one? I promise I'll bring it back. Did I ask you to promise me that you'd bring it back? Did I ask you to promise me that you'd put gas in my lawnmower before you returned it? I haven't agreed to lend it to you yet. Why are you making promises that I have not asked you to make? By the way, I'm just going to say this uh, thanks to a guy named Gavin DeBecker. Uh, I use that, that, that's referred to as the unbidden promise. When somebody says, can I borrow it from you? I promise to bring it back, and I'll even sharpen it first. 
The unbidden promise is a technique of manipulation intended to get somebody to do what you want them to do. That's what it's for. So when I hear the unbidden promise, I go, I, I use that as a, like a warning. That's one of my, I have a few spots where if I hear it, I go, oh, I'm being manipulated. When I hear the unbidden promise, I'm being manipulated. So I know this. But most people don't, and they fall for it, because then you feel guilty. I promise I'll bring it back, and it's for a good cause, you know, and you can just imagine the guilt. And after all, I'm one of the sons of the prophets, you know. Okay. But to the credit of this individual, when he does lose the axe head, because it goes flying off the handle and ends up in the river, he at least feels bad about it, quite panicky about it. I don't know, maybe the neighbor was really big. <laughs> You want to borrow my axe? I don't know. I'm not sure. It wasn't there, but he's definitely in a panic. And then Elisha does the, th what, cut off a stick and throw it in the water and it floats? Um, I, I have, there's a lot of stuff in the sort of Old Testament miracles, a lot of these weird symbolic actions. We see some of this even in Jesus' healings, like he spits on the ground and makes mud and then smears it in somebody's eyes. What? You know, there's a lot of these weird details. I am not sure what to make of most of that. It has something to do with how they thought in the ancient world. To me, it's like you just lay your hands on them and then they should be healed. Right, Jesus? That's how you normally do it. Lay your hands on them and they're healed. So what's with the spit and the mud? Because that, that's kind of gross. I mean, I'd literally be like, eh, you can leave that off. I don't. Can't you just lay your hands? So I don't know with the stick. Why didn't Elijah just, maybe, he could, why didn't he do the Moses thing, you know? Part the river wide. I, you know, it a stick and then it floats but he does and then he says there it is grab it and then it's just floating there and it's iron he grabs it and of course iron doesn't float and that's the miraculous part of this it's just what a weird story right it's it's a strange story actually I, um so jenny jenny's wedding is coming up jenny constantine's wedding jenny and jimmy getting married and I don't know how the wedding is going to go. I have no control over it and nothing to do with it. What do we say? Not my monkey, not my circus. Uh, I hope it goes really well. Um, it's one of the things when you're, when you're a clergy and you're doing a wedding, you want them to go well because if something gets messed up, then you feel really bad about it. But here's the thing. How many weddings have been messed up in the course of history? It doesn't really matter, right? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, a messed up wedding doesn't really matter. And yet there was this one wedding... And Jesus, here's what we know about the wedding. We do not know the name of the bride or the groom or of anybody else. We do know that Jesus was invited, that his mother was invited, and that Jesus' disciples showed up too. They ran out of wine. In the great scheme of things, what does it matter? And yet, Jesus made 77 gallons of really good wine. He kept that wedding party going all night. Okay? <laughs> Now, doesn't that seem weird, right? I mean, can you imagine? Oh, no, we've run out of beer. That would be a Wisconsin wedding. <laughs> and, and, and I can just imagine that the, the captain, what's called the captain of the feast, saying to the groom, uh, God, most people serve the decent beer first, and then when everyone's had a lot, then they bring out the Paps Blue Ribbon. But you've saved the really good IPA to last. <laughs> By the way, I have no idea what any of that stuff means. <laughs> I actually hate beer. <laughs> Every once in a while, my, my son is kind of a beer connoisseur. So every once in a while, I'll taste the stuff he's drinking, and most of the time I'm like... <laughs> every once in a while, I'm like, I could almost like this, <laughs> you know? And I have friends who like the weedy beers, the ones that have almost a sweet, weedy taste. I'm just like, ah. I had some of that. Somebody in Germany was like, oh, this stuff is so good. I said, let me try. Oh, man, you drink this? Ugh. All right, so please understand. It's just an illustration. I'm, I don't, for me, it would be tea, okay? And most people serve the really good Kiemen Malfung first, and then after everyone's uh, just had a ton to drink, then they start bringing out the not-so-good uh, flowery broken orange pico. You know, so that's where I'd be at. Um, <laughs> I would have loved if Jesus would have, you know, turned the water into tea. That would have been really awesome. <laughs> but, I mean, just think about this. It's just a wedding. I mean, it's important to the couple, but it's just a wedding. It's not important in the grand scheme of things. It has nothing to do with salvation and eternal life. It's not about changing the world and making the world a better place. It's just a wedding. It was just an axe head. 
you know, if that accent had never floated, maybe some archaeologist 2,000 years later, 3,000 years later, I guess 3,000, would have dug it up and went, oh, look, we've got an example of an Iron Age, early Iron Age accent. This is awesome. Let's put it in the museum, you know? And for them, it would have been a really good thing that somebody lost their axe head in the river. They'd be like, oh, find, score, you know? What, is, what a strange story. But, you know, Jesus says something. He says, you know, even the hairs on your head are numbered. That, that, that just seems like, okay, I will admit that sometimes that's more important than, you know, for some people than others the number of hairs on your head? Um, for me, my concerns are more about the, the hairs that come out of the places they shouldn't. You know what I mean? You get older and suddenly it's like, how did that get there? You just look and there's like this hair growing out like a unicorn from the middle of your forehead. Like, what? That wasn't there yesterday. Do they grow overnight? So, I mean, yeah, we, do, can, we, we can get focused on that stuff. But the hairs on your head are numbered. But you know that feeling, right? The little thing happens and it just kind of messes you up and, um, you know, you ruin dinner and you're, that just befouls the day. You're working on a roast and you kill it. I've done that before. And it's just the rest of the day. You're like, Arr. And you got to wonder, does God really care about that stuff? Doesn't it seem weird, the idea that God would care about? This is God, right? The creator of heaven and earth. God who is concerned about eternity, God who wants to see people's lives transformed, wants to see the world make a better place, as, who sends the church, that would be us, uh, to do something. We, our job description is, um, uh, here's a short form of the job description, to make disciples of all nations for the transformation of the world. Wow, that's really big. And I'm upset because the roast got burned. It's kind of embarrassing, you know? And then, so what do you do? You tell, don't you tell yourself, I shouldn't feel that way. Or even more helpful when you tell someone else that. Just let it go. <laughs> that works out well, doesn't it? <laughs> I should just let this go. How's it going? You know, it turns out that stuff is sticky. You can try to let it go, but it ain't going anywhere. It's sticky. It just hangs. It's like, ugh. Somebody says, you, you post a picture on internet, you know, on Facebook, and somebody says something nasty about it, and, you're, and then you stew about that all day. Right? You're just like, Arr. you get a text message. Have you ever notice how text messages can be read in more than one way? And if you happen to read it in the wrong way, it might be the right way. But if you read it in a certain way, suddenly you're like, <gasps> how am I going to answer this? Oh, fire coming out your head. You know, it's like these things are, these are trivial nothings. And yet in the moment that the trivial nothing is right here, it seems like the most important thing in the world. It obstructs stuff that's going on. You know, there was a, a white supremacists were openly marching yesterday. You understand that these are people who believe that God likes white people better than anybody else. I mean, and, and they're naming Jesus as they do this. So, you know, you want to know what thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain looks like? That's what it looks like. And then there was violence and people, the, uh, 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 a person was killed, run down by a car. A couple other people were injured in that same thing. Two police officers trying to, in a helicopter, who were part of you know, policing this environment, ended up dying because the helicopter crashed. I'm, I don't know the details behind that yet. Right? And yet, I burned the roast. That's what I see. And so the question becomes, can the God who is the God who's concerned about these great monumental things, salvation, right, saving humanity, eternity can that god care that i burned the roast is that is that an area of concern that can god can pay attention to is it okay for me to go oh lord i'm so frustrated i burned the roast why do you cause these terrible things to happen to me is that okay i mean that's that's the question i i you know sometimes when i pray i feel embarrassed and then i read a story about some axe head that got lost in a river or some wedding where they ran out of wine and I get reminded that, yeah, even the minutia of my life is something that God does care about and pays attention to. Can you find now the prayer of response? Let's pray that together. I fret about some small insult. I fuss about a ruined dinner. I worry about my appearance. I obsess about my wish list. I fantasize about living a different life. I am buried by the inconsequential 
while people are crying out around me. It's embarrassing, really. So I tell myself I shouldn't waste my energies on the trivial and that I should focus on the significant. I tell myself that I shouldn't feel the way I do and that I should be engaging the consequential. So what does it mean that you have made an axe head float and kept a wedding reception miraculously supplied with wine? And what does it mean that the hairs of my head are numbered? Does your love truly reach as far as my petty concerns? Does your attention include the minutia of my day? Does your accepting grace embrace even my silly obsessions? What kind of love is this that includes a cross and a tomb, salvation and forgiveness, and still has room for all that I am? Praise and glory to your name, Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. and make sure to uh, walk over and say hi to Tim and Robert.